Okay, so first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, my advisor, Dr. Mikhail Erkin. Uh, without him, I wouldn't be able to achieve this result. Uh, I also want to thank the committee for selecting the work and the sponsors for giving the prize. Uh, my work is about uh, algorithms for medium access control using network composition techniques. It is based on a paper that was accepted to a POTC conference a couple of years ago. It is a joint work with my advisor, Dr. Mikhail Elkin. Uh, the model we have studied is the standard distributed message passing model. In this model, uh, the network is represented by a graph in which uh, the vertices represent the processors, edges represent communication links. We can represent also a wireless network in this way. In this case, um, the vertices that are connected by an edge uh, represent uh, processors that are in the communications range of each other. Uh, in our model, the network is synchronous, meaning that uh, time proceeds in discrete rounds. And there is a global clock that uh, counts the rounds and it is accessible to all the vertices in the network. Uh, in each round, each vertex can uh, send short messages to its neighbors that arrive before the beginning of the next round and also perform uh, some local computations. Um, the algorithms we are dealing with are called distributed algorithms. Uh, this kind of algorithms are executed from all the vertices in parallel. Um, the, input for, the input for such an algorithm is the network itself. It is the topology of the a network that is given, all the vertices perform some uh, common task, and uh, its result depends on the topolo topology of the network, which is not known to the vertices at the beginning of the execution. And um, each vertex has to compute its part in the output. For example, in the vertex coloring problem, each vertex has to compute its color, it doesn't have to know the colors of the other vertices in the network, but the entire solution, the global solution, has to be correct. Uh, the time complexity of an algorithm is the number of rounds from the beginning until uh, the last vertex terminates. Uh, we deal with several problems. Probably the most important one is the <laughs> vertex coloring problem which is a classical problem in uh, computer science. The goal in this problem is assigning colors to vertices such that each two neighbors receive distant colors. And in a good solution, we would like that the number of colors will be small. And the motivation behind such coloring is, for example, in the field of uh, communication, is for uh, medium access schemes. Uh, in particular, for example, FDMA, we can assign uh, frequency ranges, uh, distant frequency ranges to each uh, color, then color the network, achieve a legal coloring, and then each two neighbors uh, will have a distinct uh, range of uh, frequencies. This problem is one of the most uh, studied problems in the field. It all began when the field uh, started to uh, began to develop in the mid 80s. Then um, there was a first result by Colin Wishkin. They presented an algorithm for coloring a certain topologies of graphs, uh, a simple topologies like, like uh, path and cycles. And each such graph can be colored using three colors in log star n time. Log star n is, um, n is the number of vertices in the network, and log star n is very, very efficient running time. It is um, the number of uh, iterations the log function has to be applied until we reach, a num uh, we reach a number that is smaller than two, starting from n. So for any real use, 
uh, this number is not greater than seven. For example, so this algorithm is very, very efficient. For uh, general networks, the problem uh, becomes much harder. Um, it also depends on the number of cores that is used. Uh, there is a very efficient algorithm of linear that computes delta square color in the Noxter and time, where delta is the maximum degree in the network. The degree of a vertex is uh, the number of links connected to it. So for delta square, we have a very efficient algorithm. But when we reduce the number of colors and try to use fewer colors, uh, the problems became much harder. And the best algorithm that is currently known, it is also our algorithm from last year, and uh, its running time is delta plus log star n. Um, so there are graphs that uh, cannot be colored using fewer than delta plus one colors. But for a very wide family of graph topologies, uh, a much uh, better algorithm exists in terms of number of colors. For a very wide family of topologies, we can achieve a much smaller number of colors. And this was um, the area of my research for the master degree. So we achieve faster algorithms and uh, that use uh, much less colors for a very wide family of graphs. We talk about graphs of uh, bounded arboricity. The arboricity of a graph is the minimal number of forests into which the graph can be decomposed, where a forest is simply an acyclic subset of edges. So the arboricity A is uh, the, minimum, the minimum number of acyclic uh, subsets into which the graph can be decomposed. And it is now known that uh, the arboricity is always smaller than the maximum degree divided by two plus one. So um, it's also known that uh, for a very wide and realistic uh, topologies, it is significantly smaller, smaller than delta, and therefore our results improve all the previous ones. So we have devised uh, several algorithms. The first uh, algorithm use about 2A colors, and uh, color any graph is arboricity A with 2A colors in time A multiplied by log N. We also devised another algorithm that used a bit uh, more colors, but is much more efficient. Its running time is only order of log N. We also have shown that this running time cannot be further improved. Uh, up to constant factors, and this result is optimal. Another interesting problem is uh, computing a maximal independent set. A maximal independent set is also a um, structure that is useful for uh, medium access control, and it is related to coloring. And here we have even more uh, interesting result. Here we can compute such structure in sublogarithmic time. This is interesting because um, the, uh, the last uh, result that was improved, uh, it has happened uh, 20 years ago. It uh, wasn't improved si since then. And 20 years ago, the running time was log n. So uh, we have improved and generalized a result from uh, 20 years ago. All these results are achieved uh, using the composition techniques. And the most interesting one is probably decomposing the graph into forests where the number of forests is close to minimum. The minimum is A. We are able to decompose the forest into 2A uh, forests. And we do that in log n time. And we also were able to show that such a decomposition is optimal up to constant factors. So basically, our technique is the following one. We take a general graph, decompose it into subgraphs, such that each subgraph can be easily colored, because it has a simple topology, and then uh, combine these results together to achieve illegal coloring in the entire graph. So for example, we can decompose these graphs into um, several forests, 
as follows. We have here the red forest, the blue forest, and the green forest. We also need a certain orientation of the edges that satisfies several helpful properties, and we are able to compute such an orientation efficiently. And then we can use the structure to compute uh, the coloring. The idea here, which is different from all other algorithms that were known, is that for coloring, we don't, each vertex uh, does not have to look at all its neighbors to select a new color. It only looks at its parents, which are uh, neighbors that are connected by outgoing edges. And it has a, a small number of such neighbors. And then it selects a color that is different only from those neighbors. In such a way, we can use uh, uh, much fewer colors. Not delta, but A. <coughs> so here is a quick example of how it works. It's a somewhat abstract example. So we start with the vertex that has no parents, no outgoing edges. It can select any color. Now we continue to vertices that has no uncolored parents that have, have to select the colors that are not taken by the parents. And we continue this way. This is done distributedly. So several vertices can select their colors in parallel. And in this way, we color the graph. So we want that the length of the orientation will be as short as possible. And also that uh, each vertex has a small number of outgoing edges. So in order to achieve such a coloring and uh, such a forest decomposition, we use a, a, another kind of decomposition that is also very helpful. Uh, we've called it an edge partition. An edge partition is a partition of the vertices into subsets instead of the edges. And the idea is to partition the vertex sets such that each subset will have a small degree inside. And we don't care what happens outside. So H1, H2, H3, and H4 all have a small degree inside the subset. Okay? So uh, together with the forest decomposition, we are able to uh, compute the coloring efficiently. Okay, now we can use the fact that each subset has small degree and uh, invoke a coloring algorithm in each subset in parallel. Since the degree is small, these algorithms will uh, terminate very fast, okay? But uh, the coloring inside is, um, the entire coloring is not necessarily a legal one. You can see that there is an edge connecting two endpoints which are colored with the same color. But inside each graph, each subgraph, the coloring is legal. Now we want to transform uh, this coloring into a coloring that is legal in the entire graph, entire input graph. And uh, we do that in uh, phases. For example, suppose that after uh, several phases, we have a legal coloring in this graph, which is the union of H2, H3, and H4. And now we have to um, Add also the graph H1, it has entire legal coloring. So this is done in uh, rounds. In each round, we deal with exactly one color class. So here we have to invoke two rounds. In the first round, all the green um, vertices, which, are, which form an independent set, select a new color. And in the second round, all the uh, purple vertices also form an independent set and select a new color, and it only has to be different from vertices residing in uh, sets with higher or greater index. We always uh, look only at one side. We don't look back. But still, eventually we will arrive at the legal coloring of the entire graph. Okay? And um, another interesting uh, property of our algorithms is that it is possible to invoke all of them 
even when the uh, vertices do not uh, know the arboricity of the graph. The arboricity uh, does not have to be computed. Um, we presented the generalizations of the algorithms such that they can find the, an appropriate coloring uh, with some approximation of the number of colors, of the minimal number of possible colors in the forest without computing the arboricity itself. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Next talk is by Yuval Kochman from Tel Aviv University. Modular lattice modulation, a semi-analog approach to communications. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank, thank again uh, the, the ACC and Mayor, not only for the prize, but also for uh, giving me an opportunity to, to make a break in the uh, East Coast winter and come to our sunny country. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with my uh, PhD supervisor, Ram Zamir. Uh, and I'll try to tell you what is uh, semi-analog uh, communications and uh, try to convince you that it is good for some uh, reasons. Uh, so we will start with giving some uh, motivation as to why we should uh, even consider things which are not uh, the digital communications that we're used to. Uh, then say what is modular lattice modulation and uh, give some applications. Okay, uh, so uh, the basic in the basic communication scenario, we have some uh, source process, let's call it S, uh, and we need to re reconstruct it uh, at the decoder, and we have a channel. Uh, the encoder maps the source uh, sequences into a channel uh, input signal, then the decoder takes the channel output signal and uses it to estimate the source. Uh, of course, the, the goal is to reconstruct the source with uh, as low distortion as possible. Uh, one solution, which is uh, widely known to be optimal uh, since Shannon's work, uh, is to uh, separate this into a channel problem and a source problem. Uh, so we can uh, divide the encoder into two encoders. First take the source and uh, compress or quantize it, have digital data, bits, uh, a message, and then we have a second problem of sending that message over the channel. Uh, oh, this could be better. If it's on the... Never mind. Uh, anyway. Uh, Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the, the decoder would first uh, decode uh, the, this uh, digital message and then take the message and from that reconstruct the source. Uh, this is uh, very convenient uh, practically and, uh, and conceptually. So we really need a good reason not to do that. Uh, so what are such reasons. Uh, one is when we try to deal with uh, multi-terminal scenarios. Uh, when, when there is a network, uh, the separation principle may not hold, so uh, such a solution may not achieve the optimal average distortion. Uh, 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 an example of that would be uh, when the channel conditions are unknown or equival equi equivalently when we have a broadcast channel. Uh, Second, uh, a joint source channel approach may have reduced complexity and delay since separation performance is only, uh, uh, we only have it at the limit of uh, large blocks. And uh, something that is uh, less known, and maybe we'll get to it at the, at the end of this talk, hopefully, uh, joint source channel coding uh, can be a building block uh, for channel coding problems over uh, networks. Okay, uh, so 
uh, what is modular lattice modulation that we propose? So first, uh, we need to define a, a lattice and the modular lattice operation. So a lattice is just uh, uh, an infinite set of, of points uh, with a generator matrix. Uh, so it is a linear structured code. Uh, a lattice uh, defines a partition. So we can, if we have uh, lattice points such as this one and this one, we can take uh, we, we can take the area which uh, satisfies the condition that it is the closest to one point and call it a Voronoi cell uh, of that point. So this defines the nearest neighbor quantizer. And if we take the quantization error of, of that quantizer, that would be the modulo lattice operation. Uh, for, for this work, it turns out that not any lattice uh, would be good. We need uh, lattices which are good simultaneously for uh, source coding and for channel coding. Uh, fortunately, by work of Erez, Litsin, and Zamir, we know that there exist such uh, lattices. And uh, the, in, in fact, for each uh, finite dimension k of lattice, we have some, uh, some loss factor, which is uh, the product of the uh, channel and uh, source losses. But this uh, factor goes to 1 as k goes to infinity. OK, uh, so we use such lattices. Then how do we modulate the signal? We have the source S. We just apply it to it some constant gain. Then add uh, a dither, which is a pseudo-random sequence, and take the modulo uh, lattice operation. And this is what we transmit to the channel. So uh, note that there, there is no uh, data bearing code here. The source is never quantized. It is the analog source that is transmitted modulo lattice. Uh, the, the demodulation also consists of constant factors, uh, subtracting the dether, then uh, taking again the modulo lattice operation. OK. Uh, now suppose that the source is a white Gaussian, so is a white Gaussian source and the channel is an additive white Gaussian channel. Uh, if, if, if we use uh, this encoder and decoder, it turns out that uh, if, we, if we take the right uh, uh, factor or constant gain here, uh, we can have with high probability or with probability one as the, uh, as the lattice dimension goes to infinity, we can have an equivalent channel which is uh, an additive noise channel. Uh, so effectively, uh, the modulo lattice operations at the encoder and the decoder cancel each other. And we're left uh, with an equivalent uh, additive channel. And the, the noise in this channel is such uh, that we get the optimal uh, R of D equals C performance. Uh, so this is one way to achieve uh, R of D equals C. Uh, now we have at least three ways, right? Because one way is the digital approach, which we mentioned. Uh, this is another. And also, uh, we could just use analog transmission. So this is well known that in the, the white Gaussian uh, case, analog transmission is also optimal. And it has very nice properties. It has zero delay. It has low complexity. And uh, it is robust. So the, the encoder doesn't need to know the channel uh, signal to noise ratio at all. Uh, so we will see that this uh, modulo lattice modulation partly gains the, the advantages of analog transmission. So the question is, of course, why not use uh, analog transmission? Uh, this is because in uh, side information scenarios and scenarios where the source or channel are not white, uh, analog transmission is not optimal anymore. So we're looking for something that will extend the nice properties of analog transmission to scenarios where it's not feasible. Uh, OK, so let's talk about delayed complexity. Uh, so if we, if we used uh, uh, digital source and channel codes, each such code, both the source and channel codes, would uh, consist of, a, in practice, of a data varying code and a shaping code, which sets uh, the shaping region of the code. Now, uh, in modular lattice modulation, we said that we don't have any data varying code. The, the channel, we, uh, sorry, the lattice uh, that, that is used for the uh, modular operation 
is uh, a shaping code. So we are left only with a shaping code, which is materialized by a lattice, which is uh, very uh, practically uh, attractive. And, uh, and furthermore, the source and the, the channel codes, or coarse lattices, merge into one. Uh, now, uh, this is still, we said that it is all in the limit of high dimensions, so this may still not sound very practical, uh, but in fact, uh, Itai Leibovich, which was a, a, a master student here, found a scalar version in conjunction with uh, Compending, which, uh, which achieves uh, the optimal performance in up to uh, a constant loss factor. So there is uh, a low dimensional, even scalar version of this. Uh, okay. Um, if, if we're looking for the, the region that is in between, the regime in between, so not the scalar, but not infinite, we may ask what is uh, the performance for some finite block and uh, asympt asymptotically uh, a nice tool for analysis of that is the excess distortion exponent. And uh, this is actually something that I do in a current research is uh, try, to, try to find uh, the, the exponential uh, performance of MLM, uh, I, I can say that it is certainly better than what uh, a digital code would do, since uh, in, a, in a digital scheme, errors are always large. Uh, if, if we didn't get the right code word, then we will get a reconstruction that has nothing to do with the source. Here, uh, as long as correct decoding holds, uh, even if uh, distortion is too high it, or higher than the threshold that we set, it will not be maximal. So if we average over uh, many such blocks, uh, we can have much uh, better performance than with the digital scheme. Okay, uh, another thing for which uh, this is good is robustness. So suppose that, uh, that the channel SNR is not known exactly at the encoder. Uh, if, we can still, if we can still assume some uh, worst case or minimum uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, we can uh, work with an encoder that is matched to that SNR and have some loss. Uh, if we don't know the SNR and we only know that it is high, then this loss uh, will vanish as the minimal SNR grows. So if we know that we have something with, that is high SNR, even if we do not know the exact SNR, we can have a universal encoder. Okay, uh, so now let's see to which problems we can apply this. Uh, the weiner zeev dirty paper problem. So uh, Suppose that the source S is now uh, not a Gaussian source, but it is composed of a Gaussian component Q plus some other component J, which may be arbitrary, but this uh, other component is also known uh, in a non-causal manner as a decoder. And let's assume also that the channel, besides the uh, additive Gaussian noise Z, has another interference or another noise component arbitrary again, which is known at the encoder. Uh, it turns out that the optimum distortion in this case uh, is just as if uh, I and J did not exist. So it's just as if we take the source Q and pass it through an AWGN Z. Now, since we worked modulo lattice, we get this uh, now for free. Uh, we can cancel the uh, interference I at the encoder, and we can also uh, subtract the, uh, the side information J at the decoder. So uh, we, we get the very same channel from uh, Q as the channel that we got earlier for the Gaussian source. So again, we get uh, the R of D equals C performance for this case, and anything that we said about delay, complexity, and robustness uh, carries on to this scenario. Uh, but uh, this side information problem is mainly a tool for dealing with uh, uh, more practical uh, colored sources and channels uh, case. So uh, 
imagine that the source S is still uh, Gaussian, but it's not wide. It has some spectrum. And also, uh, the channel noise is still uh, additive and Gaussian, but it is not white anymore. It has some spectrum. Uh, this includes some very important examples. Uh, for example, we can look at uh, sources or channels with, which are white, but band limited and not to, not to the same uh, bandwidth. We can look at them at, at this uh, framework by just considering the maximum uh, uh, Nyquist frequency of the source and the channel, and then the narrow, narrower of the two uh, will be, for example, a low pass like here. Uh, so for, for uh, college problems, uh, exist solutions which are by uh, prediction. This is uh, for source coding, uh, like in this uh, DPCM-like scheme, which is demonstrated, as, as well as uh, in uh, channel coding, where an FFE, DFE receiver is optimal. Uh, so uh, what we do now is we take this and combine it with the side information uh, approach. Uh, so we can use a source, a source predictor and a channel predictor. And then we can uh, look at the output of this predictor as side information. So uh, we take the channel predictor and see its output as uh, channel side information or data paper side information at the encoder. And the output of the source predictor is weiner ziv uh, side information at the decoder. Um, and uh, again, by this, we can show that we can get uh, R of D equals C for any uh, channel and source spectrum. And again, all that we said before about delay and complexity holds for this as well. Uh, finally, uh, as I promised, uh, something that is uh, less conventional, maybe. Uh, how do we use it for channel problems? So some people will, ar will argue that joint source channel coding is not really interesting. Why isn't it interesting? Because uh, sources that we deal with are not uh, Gaussian. This is not a good uh, source model. And besides, in most applications, we take, we take the data and we quantize it and we store it in a in, a, in some file, in some digital format anyway. Uh, so for, for these people, I'll say that joint source channel coding is still interesting because it can be used even in a problem that is defined as a purely channel problem. Uh, and this is by noting that a code word is actually a signal. So we can take... Uh, we, we know that for a Gaussian problem, a random code would be, uh, for, if the channel is Gaussian, then a random code should be uh, generated according to a Gaussian distribution. So we can forget that this is a code word and look at it as uh, a Gaussian process. And then apply some joint source channel processing to that process. Uh, so in a point-to-point -point scenario, uh, optimality of, of uh, of treating the code word as, uh, as a source uh, means achieving the capacity, but uh, it doesn't help. We don't really uh, need that. Uh, in the network scenario, it becomes uh, crucial. Uh, so uh, imagine that you have a wireless network and there are two encoders that, uh, that uh, transmit. And the, the, the signal is added uh, in an analog manner. So this is like a wireless multiple access channel. Uh, if, uh, if, if relays transmit a similar signal, then uh, this addition can be used to achieve a coherence gain or a beamforming gain, receive beamforming gain, sometimes called. Uh, so suppose that we want this gain but uh, the network is no longer white, so we have sections of different bandwidth or maybe a different uh, uh, ISI filter, then we can plug in uh, the modular lattice modulation into this uh, scenario. 
recall that we said that, uh, that MLM has an equivalent additive channel. So, uh, so we can take uh, a channel of one bandwidth and translate it into uh, a channel of a different bandwidth with additive noise, thus achieving uh, the coherence gain for that. Uh, okay, so to conclude, uh, we've presented module lattice modulation. It's a joint source channel coding scheme uh, uh, suitable for uh, side information problems and colored problems. We show that it is uh, asymptotically robust uh, at high SNR to uh, unknown SNR. Uh, it has uh, a delayless uh, version and it provides good uh, excess distortion exponents and it can be also used as a building block for digital communication networks. Thank you. Again. We have our final winner, Jonathan Kaspi from the Technio. Okay, so I would like to take the opportunity to thank the committee and many for this general, generous prize. <coughs> uh, this work, in this work, we derive a new lower bound to the error exponents. Uh, of, the degraded, of the broadcast channel with the degraded message set. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, my supervisor, Neri Merhav. i start with a quick outline of this talk. So I will introduce, I will review the degraded broadcast channel, just laying a uh, common notation for this talk. Uh, I'll discuss a few of the previous works and an exponent for this channel and the structure of, uh, of this, this work. And then I will focus on one of the uh, analysis techniques we used to derive the exponents, I'll introduce it through a, a simple example and then show how to uh, use the same ideas as in the simple example in our case, uh, um, finishing with some numerical results and a summary. So uh, our model is a, a degraded uh, broadcast channel uh, plotted here. Yeah, plotted here is, uh, as a cascade of two channels, our input uh, is X, the strong user having the better channel is Y, and the weak user is Z, and this is the memorious uh, channel. And we have a degraded message set, uh, which means here we're sending a common message to both users and a private message uh, that only the strong user will receive, will be able to decode. Our, our coding scheme is uh, Bergman's uh, random coding scheme, uh, where we first draw according to the common message rate, we draw uh, cloud, what we call cloud centers, according to uh, some IID distribution over an auxiliary random variable U. And then given each cloud center, around each cloud we draw a cloud uh, of code words according to the private message rate and send, uh, again, with some IID distribution of X given the auxiliary. And in order to send uh, message M to both users and message I to the uh, strong user, we'll send a code word number I from cloud number M. So we'll just pick one of these here, and the, the strong decoder will hopefully be able to decode both the cloud and the specific uh, code word, and the, while the weak user will only decode uh, the cloud center, will only determine from which cloud uh, our message uh, arrived, arrived from. So. Uh, the structured codebook makes the analysis of optimal decoding uh, quite involved, and it was avoided, to the best of our knowledge, until uh, our work. So previous works include Gallagher's work, where, where Gallagher, what Gallagher did uh, in order to uh, derive uh, the, the weak user exponent is uh, calculated the direct channel from the auxiliary uh, to the weak user. Uh, and by doing this, you now his decoder, he doesn't see, doesn't use its knowledge about the refined code book of the, of the cloud and cloud center and just uses the cloud centers. So Gallagher's exponent uh, do not depend on both rates, only on the common message rate, and uh, this approach, of course, is suboptimal. Another work uh, for general channel is by Kerner and Sgaro, where they use the MMI decoder, the Maximum Mutual Information Decoder, uh, which is shown to be optimal for the single user case. However, it's not clear that it is optimal in, in, in the uh, multi-user regime as well. And there are two other works for specific channels. 
so in this work, uh, our work can be roughly, not so roughly, can be divided to, to, uh, into two parts. Uh, the first uh, two approaches we use to derive the exponent, the first we call the Gallagher type approach, where we use a method uh, based on Forney's methods uh, for list and erasure decoding, and I won't get into the details of this at all, I'll just mention it. It exists a few times in this talk. And uh, the second approach is, we, we called it the type class enumerator approach, and uh, this is the, the topic of this talk. So our exponent, both in both approaches, our, expon our exponents per pertain to optimal decoding, uh, in contrast to previous works, which in this case for the strong decoder is just a standard problem, only with two indices, uh, standard maximum likelihood uh, problem. For the weak user, uh, he needs to determine the best cl the cloud, the cloud center that best determine, that best explains what he sees at his channel output, and therefore he, he in a way, average over all the contribution of the cloud structure. So our exponent will depend on both rates, uh, and in this talk, I'll focus on the, only on the weak user, which is uh, anyway more interesting just by looking at this, uh, at their decoders. Okay, so our starting point uh, for, for, for this work in both approaches would be to take the channel from the uh, common message to the weak user and plug it into Gallagher's upper bound on the uh, error probability. Now, if you are not familiar with this bound, it's not really important for, the, for this talk. Uh, We'll need to evaluate, I, I only uh, discuss this expression here, for this I'll need a, an extra 10, 20 minutes, so I'll leave it. Um, we'll need to uh, evaluate expressions like this, and, and if we look, this is one of those rare cases where Jensen's inequality works uh, in our favor, and not, uh, not against us. Uh, however, we'll, um, if we would have used Jensen's inequality, we would, uh, as, a, as its name implies, we'd use an inequality which we're not sure that uh, is exponentially tight. And the analysis technique we, we will use, uh, we won't have any more inequalities at all. Everything we'll do is uh, exponentially tight. This is the, the strength of this approach. Okay, so to introduce this approach, uh, let's forget for a second about the, the, our model, normal broadcast, just a simple a single user, uh, by now a symmetric channel, crossover P. Our code words are drawn uniformly over zero and one. And let's assume for simplicity that we just receive the zero sequence at the output of the channel. And again, we're going to evaluate an expression like we saw on the previous slide. So if we know this uh, expression here, we will know that here we, we sum up over all the code words. However, all the code words having the same hemming weight uh, or the same distance from the, what we received at the channel output will contribute the same value. We'll have the same likelihood here. So instead of counting over all the code words, I will count uh, all, the, all the possible the Hamming weights, and this is what I do in this step, and just multiply the number of code words I have with this weight uh, times the, what they contribute to the, to the sum. So what I gained in this uh, step here is now my sum contains a sub-exponential number of elements. And when, after I did this, the, beha the exponential behavior of the right-hand side uh, expression here will be the same exponential behavior as just the dominant element in this sum since it contains a sub-exponential number of elements. So I will go ahead now since uh, I, I need only the dominant element from here, I, I can distribute s over the summons, uh, the power s over the summons and lose nothing in exponential terms. So this is my next step I wrote here in exponential equality which means uh, the exponential behavior of both, si uh, of both sides uh, is the same. After I did this, I can just go ahead and insert the, the expectation inside here. Nothing stops me now. I don't need any inequality to do this. This is, of course, with equality. And in order to get a, an a exponentially tight analysis of this uh, state, uh, expression here, I will have to uh, evaluate the moments of the, uh, the enumerator. This n counts how many code words I have of a specific distance. Uh, so in order to do this, uh, let's remember, let's uh, remember who n is. So n is just a sum, a sum of, of indicators, each one telling me uh, does code word number i have Hemingway's d. Okay, so this is uh, n, of d, n of d. And uh, since everything is iid and uniform, uh, the expectation of this enumerator, this distance enumerator, is just, uh, just Bernoulli trials, so it's just the, it's the number of experiments I do times the, the probability of a single success. So a single success here, again, everything is uniform in this simple example. It's just that the, the, the volume of code words with Hemingway D divided by the, the volume of the whole space, uh, which is this expression here. 
Uh, and the number of, of experiments I do is just the number of code words I draw randomly, uh, which is this, and therefore I get the expectation has this uh, exponent, which I call g. It's a function of r, uh, how many code words I, I draw, and d, uh, the specific distance I now evaluate. And if I uh, plot this function, as a fun the g, as a function of d for a constant r, I get uh, this curve here with, where it has two... Uh, it is positive in this region and, and negative in, in the other region, and it turns out if I, I just give you the the, uh, the expressions for the moments uh, of, of the enumerator, uh, they behave uh, differently whether g if g is positive or negative. Where the only difference is here, when g is positive, I see s here the moment uh, I see it in the uh, here, and while we, if, when g is negative, I, my, the moment is independent of s. Okay, now the intuition behind this behavior, so we'll start with a case, with a case where G is, uh, is positive. So when G is positive, again, let's remember who is N, it's just a sum of ID indicators. These sums go pretty fast by the churn of bound. It's easy, easy to show that this sum goes uh, to its expectation uh, exponentially fast with a number of experiments. Okay, so since I'm, I'm doing an exponential number of experiments, uh, N of D will go double exponentially fast to its, uh, to its expectation. So N of D in this case is not really, I mean, by intuition it's not really a random variable. It has a specific value, which is the expectation, it, and it, it converges to this value extremely fast as N grows. So if it's not really a random variable, but just a constant, when I calculate the moments, I can just drop the, operator, the expectation operator and then raise it to the power of S. This is not again, a formal proof, but this is the intuition. The formal proof will follow the same, uh, same idea. On the other hand, when G is negative, so if we look what uh, G is, uh, I'm just not doing enough experiments to, 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 to be successful. Uh, I'm trying to win the lottery when we, we, with uh, filling two tickets or something, or 100 tickets. Uh, and therefore, when I calculate the moments, uh, of course, zero will have, I, um, I, I'm not expecting to find any code words with this Hamming weight, and zero will have the most, uh, ze zero will have the, the uh, most probability, and the next element is one. Zero, of course, contributes nothing to the, to the calculation, and then one to the power of s is still one times the probability of single success, which is again given uh, by this same expression here. So uh, this is the intuition behind uh, this a bit odd behavior. Uh, and, and now we're in business. If I'm going back one slide, we know how to get to this point uh, with, the uh, with the tight analysis, and we know how to evaluate this guy here, and I mean, a few algebraic steps, and, and we're done. So I'm now going to continue to our model, to, to the broadcast model. In our case, it's a general uh, finite alphabet and a general, uh, chan um, yeah, general uh, finite alphabet, so I won't have distances anymore. I will have uh, type classes which will replace the, um, the, the distance, but the same idea will continue to hold. I will have a G with a different, not this expression, but some other expression again, but as a function of the type class, we will have type classes for which G is positive and type classes for which G is negative. So I'm coming back to this slide. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on this uh, element here. Now, in our case, since the uh, structure of the, uh, because of the structure of the code book, my code words are IID only given the cloud center. So everything I will do uh, will be given a specific cloud center. And I note, as before, uh, now, now the, the, the type class, all the, all the code words having the same empirical conditional distribution uh, with a channel output, and the cloud center will contribute the same uh, value here. Okay, so as before, I'm counting how many code words of this type uh, I have. This is the type class enumerator and uh, what they contribute uh, to the sum. And, and now again, as I had with distances, I have only a polynomial number of such type classes. Okay, so I can again distribute S among the sum ends and lose nothing in exponential terms. Uh, and as before, all I have to do now is evaluate uh, this guy here, but the same ideas we had before continue to hold. And I will go in, what I'm going to do next is divide the type class is into those with a positive G and those with a negative G. Okay, this is what I do in this step here. Okay, so uh, this uh, calligraphic G of our Y is a group of, of, of a good type classes for G, for which G is positive, and here G is negative. Uh, and let's call this uh, exponent A and this exponent here B. 
And in order to, to uh, finish the analysis, I'll have to take the dominant term. Again, each of these sums, uh, of course, contains a, a sub-exponential number of elements. So I'll just calculate the dominant term here, the dominant term here, and take the dominant of these two, and I'm finished. Okay? Uh, and this is what is written uh, here. So just a quick observ uh, observation. If I had used uh, Jensen's inequality, of course, everything will be much more simpler because I won't have to, to deal with this. Uh, S here, um, but what I will get, however, is just this uh, expression here, the, the A, uh, but summed over all the type classes and not just the constraint to the uh, good type classes. So this, uh, this approach also, this analysis techniques also give me insights into, into when Jensen's inequality will be tight. It will be tight if the, the global maximizer of A will be the same, will have the same value as the, the, uh, the dominant element of these two um, constraint maximiza maximization problem. Okay, I don't have time to get into more details uh, on this, but uh, again, we, have, we, give, we can give insights into, into when you know, it's okay to use Jensen's inequality and remain exponentially tight. Okay, so just uh, numerical results. Um, so uh, numerical results we have for the uh, broadcast binary symmetric channel, which is, you know, again, this cascade. Our auxiliary now is also binary and uh, is distributed uniformly, this is optimal. Uh, the capacity region, of course, is known for this, uh, for this model, and what we're going to do, we're going to fix the private message rate and draw the weak decoder error exponent as a function of the common message rate. And we'll do it for two different values of, uh, of private message rate to get this. Uh, here, our is uh, the, common mess the private message rate is, is larger, and, Outside the, everything is zero, of course, outside the capacity region. And we see part two is the, what I just described, the type class enumerator approach. Part one is the Gallagher type approach, and, and previous work by Gallagher uh, is shown here. In both cases, both approaches dominate previous results, and type class enumerator result dominate Gallagher, uh, dominate our part one result. It's just much more complex both to analyze and, and to uh, compute uh, numerically. So just a quick summary. Um, we introduced uh, new lower bounds for optimum decoding, uh, and introduced doing that and introduced an, an uh, exponentially tight analysis technique. Uh, uh, so, and this technique again gives us uh, insight into Jensen's inequality, and of course, uh, all the details are in the submitted paper. And thank you very much. Again. Question?